uh, materials that contain unpaired electrons. Ah, we're being recorded. Right. So actually, that's pretty good, Christine, because we're just starting the start of the new part of the lecture. So we don't have to re-record very much. Um, so let me just uh, continue. Um, now, the vast majority of materials that contain magnetic atoms um, contain those magnetic atoms acting in, in isolation of one another. But there are materials where the magnetic atoms um, are, have forces between those atoms that prefer uh, a particular alignment of the magnetic moment on one atom compared to its neighbors. And one such example is manganese oxide. This is the example uh, chosen by Cliff Shaw to demonstrate that neutrons could reveal magnetic structure. He chose this because it's got a particularly big magnetic moment. It's as big a magnetic moment as you can get among first row transition metals because it's got a half filled shell, five unpaired electrons. Um, and within this structure, the, I've left out the oxygens for reasons of clarity, but the, man, the magnetic manganese atoms have an oxygen atom between them, and the binding to the oxygen atom, without going into any details, um, transfers, mixes the orbitals and transfers some of the information about the magnetic moment between the two orbitals. And that's the fundamental reason why there is a force coupling those moments together. And in this case, um, when you cool the material down from a high temperature, there's a, there's a point at which the, the thermal energy of the individual magnetic moments um, drops below the uh, energy that favors one particular orientation over another. And that the end result is we get an ordered magnetic structure on cooling uh, uh, into this particular pattern of magnetic moments. What we see now is if you, if you look at this little cube here, between, which has an edge, um, whose length is that between the white and the black atom. So this would have been the, um, the, the edge of the, um, the, the, the simple nuclear unit cell, um, the repeat distance being the manganese-manganese distance. When you cool this down to, um, to, into an ordered magnetic array, um, this atom and this atom are no longer seen as equivalent by the neutrons. So what we start to see is additional uh, reflections or Bragg spots corresponding, Bragg spots in a single crystal, corresponding to a, a unit cell that has got bigger um, because the neutrons discriminate now between this atom and this atom in a way that they wouldn't have if they hadn't got a magnetic moment. So what Shul and Smart demonstrated is when you cool this down from uh, um, or high temperature to below the temperature at which this magnetic array freezes in. So you start to see additional scattering. And from these additional reflections, you can determine the, uh, the, the, the nature of the new unit cell. So second reason to do neutron scattering is because they reveal directly um, the, the, the magnetic structure. Now, of course, we saw that nowadays you can also do that um, with X-rays, with resonance was resonant X-ray scattering. But it's, you may also recall that, first of all, it's a much weaker effect. And even with synchrotron, brilliant synchrotron beams, um, it, it's, still a, it's still a relatively weak and subtle effect. And you also saw that the resonance that you have to tune the energy of the X-rays to tends to correspond to relatively low energies corresponding in turn to X-rays of relatively long wavelength. And if you remember in your Bragg relation, N lambda equals 2D sine theta, if lambda is long, then for a given D spacing, so theta has to be big. And that means that you're very limited in the number of reflections you can actually measure until, um, of course, 2 theta becomes 180 degrees. So because neutrons have already have a, a magnetic moment that directly couples with the, with the the nuclear structure, and you don't have to tune it to these very long wavelengths, you can perform these magnetic measurements with relatively short um, uh, wavelength neutrons, and you can then reveal a much greater amount of information about the, the crystal structure. Um, so, yes, really just speaking through that, and just, just, just to point out in, in simple cartoon fashion, um, if the neutron didn't have a magnetic moment, it would only see the periodic array of the, the nuclei themselves. Um, and in this, I've just drawn two cartoon examples. Um, in the case of an antiferromagnetic structure, where each magnetic atom is 
pointing the opposite direction to its nearest neighbors, you can see that the unit cell goes from A to 2A. And in this case, we would start to see magnetic reflection, reflections, not just at H00, but at H over 200, of course, Miller index being the, the reciprocal of the repeat distance. Um, and then in the much rarer case of ferromagnets, I didn't mention this in any detail with the x-rays, but uh, the vast majority of materials that show magnetic ordering are anti-ferromagnets. There's a very small number of relatively rare materials where the magnetic moments are parallel to their neighbors. And we call these ferromagnets. They tend to be the ones we notice because these are the materials that also have an overall magnetic polarization. So they, they exert forces on other magnetically susceptible materials, fridge magnets on fridge uh, doors, for example. But in this case, the, uh, the nuclear and the magnetic repeat distance um, are the same. So you don't see uh, additional reflections, because I'm sure Pascal will tell you by using polarized uh, neutron beams, you can still dig um, uh, 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 information about such states um, out of the, out of the, the scattering. Um, and again, just really pointing the point of principle in a, in a rather trivial way, um, just as the, the position and the intensity of the uh, reflections in X-ray scattering, and in fact, for that matter, in, in nuclear mag uh, neutron scattering, tell you about the nuclear unit cell. So uh, the additional scattering that you see as a consequence of the magnetic moment of the neutron tells you about the detailed structure of the um of the of, of the magnetic or the magnetic structure um, and just as we 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 can uh, measure uh, structures or or verify structures model structures from powders um so we can do that um from powders of magnetic materials um in general if you recall with the x-ray um work we don't we don't determine structures a priori um, from powder diffraction. Um, we tend to model them or we, we tend to refine the scattering against a known or a proposed model. Um, but it certainly A, reveals the presence of magnetic ordering and then uh, under favorable circumstances, you can determine from the powder pattern what the magnetic structure might be. Uh, and just as we used um, uh, <coughs> polychromatic X-rays, X-ray scattering through the Bragg technique, um, to provide additional information from single crystals. So you can also perform uh, Lowry diffraction from uh, uh, single crystals of magnetically ordered materials. And again, from the nature of the scattering, dig out um, information about the individual, uh, about, the indiv about the magnetic structure. Um, again, really just sort of skimming through it um, uh, in, in a rather sort of broad brush fashion. Um, one can perform detailed measurements of magnetic phase transition. So for example, if you were to take a, a powder pattern of a material as it was cooled um, through a magnetic phase transition, so you'd be able to determine at the point at which new Bragg peaks, which could be shown to be related to the crystal structure rise, exactly uh, at what point the magnetic ordering um, set in. And so we, we can use this technique to, to reveal um, well, to confirm what the magnetic phases is, but phases are, but also perhaps to re to reveal uh, phases that were not a priori known, uh, and look in great detail at the nature of the ordering process, um, which is often very important for understanding technologically important um, permanent magnets, um, for example. And then finally, staying with magnetism, uh, in principle, in, in in very general terms, um, you'll recall in uh, we can use X rays. Um, uh, in, in, in an X-ray reflectometer, um, looking at the scattering of X-rays from surfaces and interfaces to tell us about the composition of a material perpendicular to the surface and look at buried interfaces. Well, so with the use of um, uh, uh, polarized magnetic beams, one can look at the the structure of magnetic layers and, and interfaces. So if one wanted, for example, to explore the magnetic character of the sorts of materials that are um, used in recording media, um, which often have multi-layers of materials with different magnetic polarizations, um, the way in which we would look at these layers, including buried layers and interfaces, would be through magnetic reflectometry. So by looking at the, the way in which polarized magnetic beams are 
reflected from surfaces and interfaces um, so we can we can we can depth profile what is going on beneath the skin which is often crucial to understanding these technologically important materials now i've realized there's there's, there's, an, there's an important category of uh, magnetic scattering that I've completely, it was just before this lecture, I thought, oh dear, I've actually lost a couple of slides. But just to mention in passing, um, that a, a, a final important category of, of materials that have magnetic properties that are technologically important are superconductors. And it's a, it's a characteristic of superconductors that um, uh, the, 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 well, what could be regarded as a magnetic structure, but the way in which magnetic fields um, pass through superconductors can give rise to uh, magnetic scattering of neutrons that is characteristic of the, the distribution of magnetism throughout superconductors. And that gives you invaluable insights into the physics uh, of superconducting materials, and it allows us to test how to make better uh, superconducting materials. So, for example, if you want to um, improve the performance of some of the permanent, um, some of the um, superconducting elements of the materials that go into, into body scanners and so forth, um, then it's um, then it's it, it, it's it's very important to have insights into um, the structure of the field as it propagates superconducting uh, materials. And I, I, I'll insert a couple of slides and perhaps overdub some of the recording to just also introduce this important aspect of neutrons as a probe of the physics of superconductors. So the third strand and the third reason why um, it's worthwhile producing and using neutrons is because of their energy. Um, so the energy of thermal neutrons, well, it shouldn't come as a surprise. We've produced neutrons whose energy um, has, has, has uh, the center uh, equivalent to um, uh, the thermal energy of a body at room temperature precisely by passing them through a medium, through a moderator, which itself is at room temperature, typically a large volume of, um, of a liquid such as H2O or D2O. Um, so it should come as no surprise that the, the neutrons we get out the other end, having thermalized with the medium, um, have an energy which is comparable to the energy of the molecular motion that you have in, in bodies of fluids. And that means that they have exactly the right energy to probe such processes. And there's a wide range of processes here. They could be, uh, they could be vibrations. So for example, the vibration you get in, in simple molecules in the catalytic system. Um, they could be vibrations in the solid, and as we'll see a little bit later, um, these are not vibrations of a discrete nature. These are vibrations that propagate as waves throughout the entire um, uh, uh, solid waves that are also called phonons. Um, we see uh, 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 translational diffusional motion. So one of the Nobel prizes associated with neutrons was that of De Gen, who was a theorist um, who uh, uh, came up with a theory that described the way in which polymers move in molten polymers or in solutions of polymers, the so-called polymer reptation model, where a, a long polymeric material um, slides through a complex medium. And it was neutron scattering that provided the first experimental um, verification of Degen's ideas about the, the nature of polymers. We see, uh, we, see, we, we, we see motion in biological systems, so the motion of ions through so-called Iron channels, that's an important part of the signaling mechanism in, 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 in cells, um, uh, is also something we can probe uh, neutrons. And as we've just mentioned, because neutrons have this magnetic moment, um, then the scattering of neutrons from magnetic materials can also tell us about uh, magnetic excitations, whether they're excitations in solids uh, or molecular excitations. And here, um, this is a, a, a relatively small uh, molecular cluster that contains, I think it's 12 uh, manganese ions of different um, oxidation state. But the point is that collectively, this molecule has an overall massive magnetic moment. Um, and it, in principle, could be used as an element um, in a magnetic recording device where the, the individual piece of information has now been shrunk down to, to an individual molecule. So systems such as this so-called single molecule magnets um, are being explored as potential 
elementary units in in extremely small high density uh, magnetic recording devices and even ultimately for those of you familiar with it um, in the construction of qubits in, in quantum computing um, oh sorry i'd forgotten we got this animation here so so the overall <coughs> collection of spins um, coupled together in this little molecule has a net magnetization which means the this molecule has an overall uh, uh, giant moment associated with it um, so as i said the neutrons that we use in 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 that come out of a reactor after moderation or a spallation source after moderation um, uh, have an energy range which is typically um, in, in 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 this region here so this is a, a generic cartoon of the the the, the range of um, processes inelastic processes that you might <coughs> find in in molecular materials or solids or molecular samples or solids um, going all the way from uh, extremely low excitations to the very highest energy excitations um, we've already looked at some of the highest energy excitations in 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 the principles of x-ray physics um, so transitions that involve um, uh, uh, photo excitation of core electrons or valence electrons. Um, so these are the two uh, types of processes that we saw in, in, in high and low energy photoionization events. Um, and then coming down in energy, um, we see the, 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 the vibrational excitations um, typically at um, a tenth or maybe even a hundredth of an electron volt. So, you know, the, the, the energies that we were talking about um, in X-ray spectroscopy were, 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 were kilovolts um, downwards. Um, vibrations tend to be uh, a significant fraction of, of an electron volt. Uh, and then as we come down further in energy, so you know, in, in simple molecular terms, we're familiar with vibrations, a, a small set of discrete types of vibration. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, in, in molecular systems, and then coming down even lower in energy, we start to probe um, processes such as rotations and translations of molecules um, in, in fluid. So molecular vibrations in, in this region here, and then at the very lowest of energy, um, molecular diffusion or, or, or rotation. And these are called quasi-elastic scattering. Um, they, they are, they, they, these have transitions whose energy, sorry, these, these involve processes whose energy is so low, it's, so, it's usually very difficult to distinguish them from the elastic scattering, the scattering where there is no motion whatsoever. So we, this energy range from low to high goes from the so-called quasi-elastic region, molecular diffusion and rotation, um, through to, <coughs> excuse me, lower energy elastic processes and vibrations all the way through to low and then high energy electronic transitions now many of you will be familiar with other techniques that can be used to look at such spectroscopic processes most commonly infrared and raman scattering um, which typically probe vibrational and rotational um, uh, excitations and are, you know you can get benchtop infrared machines for a few thousand maybe tens of thousands of euros um, why build multi-million, um, multi-billion facilities to look at vibrations? There must be something additional um, that you get from the neutron scattering. Um, you can also, of course, perform NMR microwave uh, measurements and increasingly actually start to probe some of these processes through um, computational techniques. Um, though, of course, we would always like to be able to experimentally verify something, however confident we are in the, um, in the computer. Um, calculation and turning the energies this is all couched in terms of energies but transforming it to um, the time scales of the process you know the slowest processes are taking place over significant fractions of a second all the way through to a femtosecond which is um, a thousand times um, uh, uh, faster than the picosecond which in turn is a thousand times faster than the second it has to be said incidentally that um, looking really in 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 in, in in, in, in practical terms, um, most of the neutron scattering events we, we, we are looking at tend to be in the sort of the, the nanosecond region. And you can start to imagine, and we'll see this later, how it fits into um, the spectrum of techniques that we use to look at spectroscopic transitions in general. We'll come to that a little bit later on. Um, ooh, frozen. Why isn't it moving on? Here we go. So how do we do the measurements? 
a um, bit of nostalgia for you, Pascal. Um, iron five dial L. So in, in very general terms, what we do in a spectroscopic experiment is we measure the energy of the neutrons coming in and the energy of the neutrons after they've been sc scattered by the sample. Uh, and the difference between the two, of course, is the energy is transferred to or from um, the sample. Um, in addition, and we'll see this in, in, a, in, a, in a few more minutes, um, it's also useful to measure the change in the momentum uh, of, 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 of the neutron. And we can do this in one of two ways using one of two types of spectrometer. So the traditional way, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit measure, messy, um, is the so-called triple axis spectrometer. And in a triple axis spectrometer, you, you take your neutron beam in, so it's coming in from the top here, um, uh, <clears throat> from, from, in this case, the reactor, and the picture at the bottom, incidentally, is a, is a, is a photograph of a real triple axis spectrometer. You scatter the beam uh, off, a, off a crystal whose um, despacing is known at an at a angle that you can measure, um, and therefore you can determine the wavelength from the Bragg relation um, uh, of the um, of the, the scattered uh, of the scattered neutron, um, and actually you can select neutrons of, of different energies in this way. But the point is that the the, new, the neutrons that are scattered from the monochromator at the first axis onto the sample have a known energy, and of course they have a known momentum, which is defined by um, the, by this part of the a vector triangle. They're then scattered from the sample. They come off um, with 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 a different vector, and of course. The, the change in the momentum is just the uh, momentum of the scattered neutron less the momentum of the, um, uh, the, the momentum change rather is the momentum of the scattered neutron less the momentum of the incident neutron. You then direct them, so this is the second axis, the sample, and then you direct them onto another crystal of a known D spacing and you scatter it at a measured angle and you can therefore determine um, the wavelength and therefore the energy of the scattered neutrons. So um, the incident energy is known, the energy of the scattered neutrons can be determined um, by the use of this analyzer crystal and therefore the difference between the two is the energy that has been transferred to or from the crystal. And at the same time you measure the, the change in the momentum of the neutron and of course the law of conservation of momentum tells you that's equivalent to the momentum of the um, of the mode of the thing that you have excited in your sample. So triple axis spectrometer for obvious reasons because it has three axes: the 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 energy selector, um, the incident monochromator, the sample itself, and the analyzer. You can perform um, uh, spectrometry um, also at um, uh, well, I won't say it's just a spallation source. Of course, this can be done at neutrons, but be using um, the technique we introduced last week, which is to use a set of timed choppers to select neutrons um, of a particular energy. And by also measuring the time at which a pulse is delivered to the sample and the time taken for the neutrons to be detected after scattering, um, you can measure the, um, the energy change of the neutrons as they scatter. So let's just think through that one. So you, you have your neutrons coming in from your neutron source um, uh, through a set of choppers, so uh, which are just rotating discs, as we introduced last week, with slots in them. And depending on the, um, the distance between the discs with slots, the choppers, um, and the phase uh, difference of the, of, the, of the slots, then you can choose um, what the velocity of the neutrons that will go through both sets of rotating slots will be. And if you know the velocity of the neutron, then you can work out its energy. So you deliver neutrons of a known energy to the sample. Now, the, the chopper system also allows you to time um, uh, the delivery of the pulse to, 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 to the sample. So you effectively, if you've delivered, at least in this simple incarnation of the spectrometer, uh, a pulse of neutrons of a known energy um, at a given time. And then around the sample, you, uh, you arrange a, a very large array of uh, uh, detectors, uh, which are separated or, or distinguished by the scattering angle. And here you can see the spectrometer itself. So to give you an idea of the scale, this, 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 this um, plastic 
um, shielded um, uh, detector bank is three meters high. And if I remember correctly, the total area of detectors here is, 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 is of the order of 20 square meters. Um, so these are massive detectors compared to X-ray detectors. But of course, the resolution of the measurements are in, ter in terms of spatial size, are, are, you know, the beams involved are larger, the scale of everything is, <coughs> excuse me, is, is, is much, much larger. So what this allows you to do, if you've, if you've delivered um, a pulse of known energy to the, the, the sample here, and then you measure the time at which your signal starts to appear on the individual elements of the detector. And that tells you, you can work out, therefore, the time it has taken for, for neutrons to come from the sample to the detector, which in turn tell you the speed of those neutrons. And knowing the speed of those neutrons, you can work out their energy after the scattering. So this tells you the, the you can select the energy of the neutrons coming in, you can measure the energy of the scattered neutrons. So just like here, you can measure the energy difference. Um, and by measuring the angle through which the neutrons are scattered, you can also um, you can also work out the change in, in the momentum. So, so both techniques give you the same information. Um, this tends to give you all of the information in one go uh, as a function of the energy and the, the momentum um, transfer. It can be transformed into those coordinates. Um, but of course, it's distributed um, over a much wider area. And it tends to, you've also got a much larger detector, but this tends to be wonderful at creating surveys. Um, the triple axis spectrometer tends to be used to measure individually selected points in energy and momentum transfer space. Um, and if you do look into this in detail, incidentally, the, the momentum, the, the, the uh, the momentum transfer with the sample is you, there's a plethora of symbols used little q big q k and all the rest of it kappa um i'm going to stick to to k mainly for this but because of some of my diagrams have been borrowed from elsewhere um, you won't find unfortunately a consistent labeling but just be aware that different authors um, even in the scientific literature use different units so so what kind of things can you um, actually measure um so in schematic terms um, what we would like to do, starting with the lowest energy system, translations and rotations, is we would like to measure the change in energy as the neutron is scattered and, we would, and, and the change in momentum at the same time. If it's purely elastic scattering, then we'd see a very sharp spike around zero energy, whose width was limited by the resolution, the ability to discriminate um, the energy um, of a, at a particular point of the instrument. Um, but then superposed on, on, on that, there will be a signal that arises from the fact that some of the scattering um, will reflect the translational and the rotational motion of those molecules. And that tends to be distributed over a range of energies, which are close to, but distinct from, if your resolution is good enough, the, um, uh, the, the central elastic line. And for this, you tend to need to build a, a particularly high resolution type of spectrometer. These are very specialized. But with these spectrometers, you can get very detailed information about the nature of molecular motion. And to give you one example, and I should have said incidentally, um, in all of this, it turns out that um, scattering from systems that are rich in hydrogen, scattering from the hydrogen itself, are, provide particularly powerful um, uh, particularly strong signals. So inelastic neutron scattering techniques in general um, are, are highly sensitive to the motion of species that contain, contain hydrogen. And of course, an important problem um, in chemistry and material science is try to understand um, the motion of light molecules in a variety of cells, fuel cells in particular. And with neutrons, you can you can select um, a region, you know, imagine selecting a region uh, of your system, focusing the incoming beam and taking the neutrons off at a particular point, which will define the region being studied. You can direct a neutron beam and analyze um, the scattering for a rather specific place deep inside a fuel cell. And then by measuring the quasi-elastic scattering, that gives you direct information about the diffusion of the molecules in that in that system. So in this particular example, there are many studies, um, and I see I've lost the reference here. I'll add that to the, the final version I, I deposit. This was a study of um, uh, 
uh, an electrolyte system where um, the, the, the cell relies on the flow of uh, water or protonated water through a porous polymeric membrane made out of nafion. Um, and one of the things that was required was an understanding about how the water moves through polymer samples of different character, different porosities, for example, um, and then how that changes as a function of temperature. And by measuring the evolution of the scattering around the central elastic peak, and so you can see as you go from here, um, uh, actually over a series of, of wavelengths, which tell you about different uh, forms of momentum transfer, so you get a, a, an enhanced scattering around the elastic peak, which tells you directly after you've transformed it um, into in the, 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 the distribution of energy around the, 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 the elastic line, the quasi-elastic scattering. So neutrons as a powerful way of measuring diffusional and rotational motion of molecular species, in this case, hydrogen-rich molecular species, deep inside um, a device. At higher energies, we mentioned that neutrons start to probe the, um, the vibrations in, in the material. So, so for example, for a simple molecular system, you'd expect to find a set of discrete so-called normal modes. So if you're now to scatter the neutrons off such a simple system, molecular system, you would now see um, absorption of neutrons or, or rather scattering of neutrons um, at different energies um, with, with discrete values, at values which reflect the particular vibration, the particular discrete vibrational modes of, of the molecule. So you'd expect to see a series of peaks um, uh, which could be related, which essentially provide a fingerprint for, um, for the molecule. Now that's exactly what you have in infrared and Raman scattering. So again, at first sight, it's a rather expensive way to perform infrared and, and Raman scattering. Um, so why do you do it? Well, you do it because it gives you insights into systems that are not amenable to infrared and Raman. And to give you one example, this is a uh, results that are just starting to come through. Uh, actually, not not just starting to come through. The, these are results taken on a, a real working dirty catalyst. On the surface of this catalyst, um, there will be molecules that come in. They're transformed chemically on the surface of the catalyst into a product molecule of interest. And the question is, what is the chemistry from starting molecule to product? Now, many working catalysts are powders, black, messy powders. They are particularly um, unsuitable for measurements with infrared or, or Raman spectrometers. The beauty of the neutrons is that they are penetrating, so they can pass straight through the catalyst material. Um, they are scattered particularly strongly by hydrogen-rich species. Um, so unless your catalyst material is, 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 is also full of hydrogen, it tends to pick out um, uh, vibrational modes which involve the motion of, of hydrogen. Um, and it, it also turns out that the, the scattering from, um, of neutrons from molecular species doesn't have the, um, the same selection rules that infrared and Raman have. In infrared and Raman, there are selection rules that mean you don't see all of the, the vibrational modes. With neutrons, you see all of them. And furthermore, you know, in infrared and Raman, the vibrations that have the greatest amplitude, um, which involve the greatest dipole change or whatever, have the strongest um, scattering cross-section. With neutrons, it's the opposite. Neutrons pick out most strongly the low amplitude mode. So it's utterly complementary to infrared and Raman and often applicable to systems which are completely opaque and impossible to study by infrared and Raman. So in this particular example, um, what the chemists were interested in, what was the, the transformation, um, uh, the transformation uh, molecule, uh, sorry, transformation mechanism uh, from starting molecule to, to end product. Um, and what the experimentalists were, allowed, were able to do is to show that um, the inelastic scattering, the inelastic neutron um, uh, uh, scattering spectrum for the working catalyst showed a number of peaks which could be related to known to modes of known energy for likely intermediate um, gas molecules. So provided uh, direct insight in an operando system into molecular intermediates that would not have been possible um, with infrared or Raman. 
Um, and then finally, with excitations, um, what happens in solids? Well, in solids, you don't get discrete vibrational modes within a molecule. You get extended vibrational modes within the entire um, um, solid. So and I'm going to try and illustrate that with, with, with a number of, of cartoons. Um, so um, uh, in, in, in this case here, let's just start with what's called the transversal mode. So um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm colorblind, but I think these the blobs on the line are gray. So this represents the position of the atoms at rest without any excitation. Um, and you can excite in solids wave-like motion. They're the vibrations. They're, you know, it's the reason why sound propagates through, um, actually through solids and fluids. Um, and and, and what, what, that, um, what that vibrational mode actually involves is a wave-like disturbance of the atoms from their regular rest position. And they can be uh, disturbed in the transverse fashion. So, um, so if this is the direction of the motion of the, um, of, the, of the wave, of the sound, if you prefer, you can have a transverse wave where the displacement is perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the wave, or it can be longitudinal, uh, up and down that direction. And again, the, the gray blobs, or the blobs that look gray to me, uh, are the ones with the atoms at rest um, and, and, and the wave-like motion in longitudinal direction involves this wave-like displacement. So this atom and this atom are not displaced, but the ones in the middle are displaced to increase, have a great increasing amplitude of displacement. Now, what we'd like to be able to do is to uh, measure the, uh, the energy of these waves in relation to their wavelength. Um, and the, the difficulty, if you try to do it as I've just described it, is that at one end of the spectrum, you have the, all of the atoms at rest. Now, if all of the atoms are at rest, um, actually the wavelength is infinitely long. There is no disturbance whatsoever. You, you know, in, in your thought experiment, you have to go an infinite distance away to see any displacement, i.e. it doesn't happen. So this corresponds to the case of an infinitely long wavelength. The the maximum, in this case, transverse displacement is where every atom is displaced um, uh, in a completely opposite sense from its neighbor. And you can see here the, um, the separation to go from one atom back to its original position is twice the normal atom-atom uh, separation. So this wavelength is twice A, where A is the atom-atom separation. So, what we'd like to be able to do is to express the energy of this wave all the way from a displacement of 2a to infinity. Now, it's a very inconvenient scale to use. So what we tend to do, and certainly what physicists do, is to express the energy of the wave as the reciprocal of the wavelength. So we can condense everything down onto a, a more manageable scale. So the, 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 the standard way to disp display the spectrum of energies of waves um, is as the energy of the wave plotted against something related to, to one over the wavelength. And actually what we do is we, 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 um, we plot it against the quantity K, which we actually spoke about in the XAFs reconstruction. Um, and K is just two pi divided by the wavelength. So at the center, you have all of the atoms at rest. This is the ground state. This is the minimum energy. Um, so if lambda is infinity, two pi over lambda is zero. And then as you start to increase the wave to shorter and shorter wavelengths, um, i.e. longer and longer values of 2 pi over lambda, the limiting case, the highest energy excitation, which is where each atom is in antiphase, is in opposition to its neighbors, this corresponds to lambda is to 2a, and therefore 2 pi over lambda is, is just pi over a. And this corresponds to a wave going in one direction and a wave going in the other direction. Um, and so this, this, this so-called dispersion curve, the energy plotted against 2 pi over lambda, summarizes, it, just in this simple cartoon fashion for one direction in the crystal, but it summarizes the whole spectrum of excitations that you might expect to measure in the, in, in, in the solid. Um, and actually, that's exactly what you can do in a neutron scattering experiment. This is equivalent to the momentum of the wave, and in your triple axis or your... Um, uh, your time of flight spectrometer, you're measuring the energy 
versus k. So you're actually directly measuring points, or in one fell swoop on the on the time of flight spectrometer, uh, or, or the whole dispersion curve. Um, and I should just say, before I show you the measurements, you get exactly the same phenomenon in magnetic systems. So you might have an ordered magnet, which is at rest, but just as you can excite the atoms in a solid um, to, to support vibration, vibrational waves, so you can support the magnetic moments, which are sometimes colloquially called spins, into spin waves. Um, so you can excite collective, um, coherent, excitations, rotation, what's called precession of the magnetic moment. Um, in this case, um, the wavelength, uh, well, this is half the wavelength because you've got a, uh, a moment here which is precessing. Um, at this particular point, it's at this point, it's precession. It's gone through 180 degrees. Um, this is not drawn very well, actually, but it's 180 degrees here. Um, so it takes another half wavelength to get back to its original position. And just as you can, um, um, you can measure dispersion of vibrations in, in, in nuclear systems of the crystal structure. So you can measure um, excitations, um, spin wave excitations in magnetic systems. And just going back, by the way, um, measuring this energy tells you directly about the force between the atoms, the elastic force. Um, so without going into the details, measuring this energy here tells you about the strength of the force or the coupling um, between the magnetic moments um, in the solid. And that's, as I said, is exactly what you measure in a inelastic neutron scattering experiment. So whether it's a triple axis or whether it's a time of flight instrument, um, you measure these dispersion curves. In the triple axis, you're, you're measuring point by point the energy as a function of the, the momentum transfer, which is this K. So this is just like the previous cartoon um, uh, um, dispersion curve uh, and in a time of flight spectrometer actually you're measuring a range of q and k all sorry of, of energy and k here it's i'm afraid the, the diagram i've stolen um, has it in terms of what's called q but it's still k in the parlance that we've been using so far so this tends to be used um, traditionally to perform surveys of large areas of space um, for reasons that pascal might go into i don't know uh, you might also then wish to look in greater detail at individual points and look, for example, at the, uh, at the polarized character of the scattering, which gives you um, even more insights into, into the magnetic nature of, these, um, uh, of these, these excitations. And these are the most direct and powerful way to study um, vibrations and magnetic excitations in, in, in solids. So um, inelastic neutron scattering, just to tie up, um, why do we do it and when do we do it? Well, thermal neutron energies are particularly matched to these excitations, which are typically a bit below an electron volt to uh, thousandths of an electron volt. That's the range of typical vibrations and magnetic excitations. There are exceptions, but that's, um, um, they allow you to simultaneously measure the energy, the excitation, but also its amplitude the x-axis in your dispersion curve. There are no selection rules as for infrared Raman and low amplitude excitations are easier to see. They're very penetrating. You can look at these excitations buried deep inside materials and they're particularly sensitive to protons. And if you look at the, the sort of spectrum, maybe I shouldn't use spectrum in this sense, but the range over which neutrons are useful with regard to the energy of excitations and the, the, uh, the momentum of the excitations, then depending on the kind of neutron um, measurement um, type of spectrometer, you can cover a vast range of the energy of the excitations and, and its momentum transfer. Um, and, and you'll see here that it's, um, it's, it's a valuable um, uh, complement to light scattering measurements, but also other techniques such as NMR um, spectroscopy. Um, very versatile, very widespread, depending on the design of the spectrometer. But you'll also see in this corner here, and this would have been um, a heretical thing to uh, display as a diagram, oh, I don't know, 50 years ago, it would have been, you know, people who looked at it and go, what? How on earth can you include x-rays in here? Because um, x-rays surely um, are... Uh, uh, too high an energy to look at these excitations. And you look at the scale here, um, these are inelastic X-ray measurements that you know are, are being portrayed as, as measuring 
um, down to e even down as small as uh, milli electron volts. Um, and actually, you know, 50 years ago, and sorry about the quality, but this is an excerpt from a, a classic textbook by a man called William Cochran, who was the guru uh, of uh, uh, vibrations of solids in, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and one of the things he wrote confident in his textbook is basically um, the energy changes involved in, uh, in X-ray scattering processes are so great um, that, uh, I'll quote, information about phonon spectrum of the crystal cannot be obtained in this way. Um, I love quotes like this, which 50 years later, are, you know, I mean, at the time this made absolute sense, but what wasn't foreseen was the incredible advances in the technology of um, synchrotrons. Um, so just to sort of leave that as the header, um, you know, if we want to measure excitations whose energies are one to 100 millivolts, um, and at the same time, remember that we, we, we may also wish to measure the momentum. So the wavelength uh, of the radiation we're using should also be of the order of 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers. Uh, of course, you know, we, 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 could, we could get energies of uh, photo, you know, we can get photon energies down to this but they have incredibly long wavelengths and you wouldn't be able to usefully measure much get much information about the momentum transfer so what we want is we want a combination of an, measuring an energy transfer in this range using radiation um, whose energy whose wavelength is in this range and of course you would think about that for for x-rays that corresponds to um well you know one angstrom corresponds to 12.4 kilovolts um uh, and if you want to measure, you know, excitations are down to the sort of 10 millivolt um, regime, that means you need to have a resolving power of about 10 to the minus six for X-rays. Um, whereas with neutrons, your resolving power of your instrument only has to be a factor of about 10. So this is a very easy ask of a neutron spectrometer. Um, at the time, the technology did not exist to be able to build an X-ray spectrometer um, with this kind of resolution. And now you can, and now you can because the engineering is 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 amazingly um, uh, precise and stable. And I'm sure. Sorry about the, the the again the size of the picture here, but this is this is the most recent generation of inelastic X-ray spectrometer. We've got one at Diamond. There's one at ESRF, which for which ours was a copy, um, but along the way improvements have come in so although the principles are the same we were able to build something which with a much higher resolution and just to give you an idea the, your x-rays are coming in here the sample is in this vacuum chamber and then they are scattered um, into a detector that's held here and that detector is I think 15 I'd have to check but it's 15 um, meters away and the pixel size um, of the detector is very very small so the angle through which you're scattering the x-rays is absolutely minuscule. And that gives you the resolving power. It's the ability to place a high resolution detector a long way from the sample with an extremely small beam. And not only that, to keep the whole thing stable. So all of this, this massive, I mean, this is, you know, as I say, the scale is, this is about 15 meters uh, and it can rotate on air pads on this ultra smooth stone um, floor inside a building that looks big it is big because it's got to house this monster um, but it's the, the temperature is controlled within this building to about 0.1 of a degree and that stability the precision of the engineering the smallness of the angle mean you can actually now get a resolving power um, uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 5 and, and perhaps even um, even lower so nowadays what was impossible in the 1960s and was the key reason to develop these neutron scattering techniques um, is no longer uh, absolutely the case for X-ray. So at the cutting edge, um, you can now start to look at phonon events, vibrational events, whose energies go down to about 10 millivolts. It's still actually, so there's still a good reason to perform neutron scattering. We're still an awful long way with X-ray at going below 10 millivolts. And there's a lot of really interesting chemistry and physics and material science below that energy. But what we now have is, is two complementary techniques that overlap much more strongly in this sort of 10 millivolt and up scale. And why would you want to do this? I mean, this is a very difficult beam line to build. Um, it's extremely expensive. Um, why do you do it? Because the strength of the um, 
scattering process with x-rays and the brightness of our beams mean we can put tiny samples in the beam and now you know the the, the samples that are typical for neutrons and i didn't say this explicitly but they tend to be of the order of millimeters across that they can be much smaller nevertheless with with x-ray sources you can actually look at single films of magnets and other materials whose excitations you might be interested in and and look at them through these um uh, inelastic x-ray scattering and then combined with the technique um mentioned at the end of the x-ray course if you also tune to uh, an absorption edge you can now start to look at the uh, magnetic excitations associated with individual orbitals so i'm going to end there and what i hope i've done is given you a flavor of two types of technique that have some overlap but are very complementary um, spanning almost the entire range of science and increasingly so as 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 we bring the techniques to the attention of um, a wider range of potential users um, and i think what's also really interesting if you think back over the years um, what was impossible you know we see in this example from the textbook in 1966 when i was an undergraduate in the 70s um, it, 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 people were talking about performing angular angular resolve photoelectron spectroscopy but there's a kind of a thought experiment you know it'll never be possible to do this or we don't know how to do it and i think one of the things that's interesting is the way in which the the development of the technology enables new measurement techniques which give you wholly new insights into into science and and that's why these continue to be such dynamic fields so you know when the spallation source comes on stream in lund it will offer completely new capability again um, and next generation synchrotrons are also opening the door to um, completely different types of experiments. So I think it's also, you know, my only regret doing what I do now is I'm not a young scientist again who can have another career with a completely different palette of, of, of tools to use. Um, and, you know, if you go into these fields now as a, as a young scientist, you have the prospect that in 10 years time, it can be completely different again. So it's a really uh, dynamic and, and fast moving field. And then the application to science is, well, it's just limited by your imagination. So I, I think it's a it's a really exciting time to be a scientist who, who exploits uh, these two types of technique. Right, I'm gonna stop at that point. I'll just leave the, ooh, there you got Grenoble, where well, hey. Um, uh, and, and Christine's mountains that she showed us at the end are sort of behind this mountain ridge, but one. You have to go two ranges behind that, Christine. But from the top here, no, you can't see your mountains. You've got to go to the next range. But you're only about 10 kilometers away. So um, so websites there, uh, ESRF um, and ILL uh, in Grenoble. And then um, in my case, closer to home, um, uh, Diamond here and the uh, ISIS source here. And what I should have done Oh, I haven't. I should have got one for Lund as well, where we'll, we'll well, with with um, with with Max Four and um, ESS. So I'll, I'll I'll add a final slide with your two facilities there at the end, and I will stop at this point. And I'm very happy to take questions, but I will have to go on the hour to another meeting. I'm afraid. Okay, so it means that we have yeah, so 13 minutes for question. So indeed, this is really good to finish by this because it really. <laughs> with the first slide that you had as well, showing the synergy as well between the light source and then the neutron type of, uh, of result that you can get. And then you had uh, in your first lecture also the SS and the back score. And I think it's important it that that was a bit what we wanted as well for this series uh, to show how in different places as well in, uh, in Europe, we are, we are combining the, the power of neutron and, uh, and of photons. And, and you're right, Christine, I actually have that slide right at the start of my so I'll just put it at the end as well. Yeah, so that, yeah. I'll do that before I load up. Yeah. It's really easy to, to do. So it's so wonderful. So then really quickly, we had indeed uh, during the presentation, so I'm sorry, uh, Malik, because I, I, couldn't, oh. I couldn't see it. So there was a question from Malik. Maybe you have the answer from the last uh, graph or the figure. Where, ah. uh, so potentially we will let, if Malik, you can speak up maybe first, that would be great. Oh, and Ak Akarede, thank you very much for your colorblind question as well. I, I, I always thought they were gray, but if they're a lighter shade of red, then I've learned something today. Yeah. I wanted to finish by that. This was Malik. a anecdote as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so, yeah. So Malik, thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, in what areas? So, um, 
if you act, if you look at the way that neutrons and x-rays are used today across a site like this uh, the overlap is probably about the 10 or 15 percent level um, and it's mostly in powder diffraction looking at the structure of new materials and in small angle scattering um, looking at the complementary x-ray and neutron probes of relatively large objects. They could be individual molecules or they could be pores in the system, defects in the system, but that's where the overlap is strongest. Um, uh, I, I think it's true to say that the biology is still mostly distinct because the systems that can be studied with x-rays and neutrons are mostly quite different. That's not to say they aren't somehow related, but those two, but there are notable exceptions, particularly in Grenoble, where there's a central lab that supports biology in both facilities. Um, and I would say the other area that's becoming really interesting, really interesting, um, is the overlap between, um, uh, between inelastic and inelastic X-ray and neutron techniques at these lower uh, energies. So the, the, the traditional, you know, if you are someone who is looking at the physics of some of these really complicated magnetic systems, um, you would have almost always used um, uh, neutron techniques. And I would say there's much greater overlap into inelastic X-ray and also uh, into ARPES measurements. So, it's, um, so there is these clusters of activities, materials science and physics um, on the, the sort of the exotic physics end of things, and then the material science with more powder uh, measurements and, and small angle scattering. I'd say those are the main overlap areas in terms of technique, but of course it spans huge areas of material science and, uh, and, and chemistry and physics. Yeah, very good. So I think it's, uh, it's answered uh, quite comprehensively as well, the question of Malik. So do you have any more comment, Malik, on that? Or I don't know if you have the possibility to connect or to speak, to speak up. Not sure that you can. Uh, well, I, I've noticed a really good question from, from Samela, mm -hmm. and it's something I didn't touch on at all, but it's, it is, <laughs> maybe I should if I ever give this again, but um, it, a really important complement to all of this increasingly is the computational work um, and the power of computation to predict and then also to rationalize the result from it has, has really increased immensely. So techniques like functional, density functional theory um, not only allow us to analyze our results um, much more effectively, but uh, increasingly um, to guide us where to look. So, you know, if you're trying to search around in energy and momentum space for a signal, then it's, it's helpful if initially you've got some idea about where to focus your attention. Um, and so I, I would say that computational techniques um, are becoming an indispensable part of um, doing these kinds of measurements. Um, absolutely. So um, I do have a question, sorry, two questions. Um, the first one is, before the start of the lecture, you mentioned using magnetic moments in qubits for quantum computing. Ah, yes. Um, just out, out of curiosity, I just want to ask if you could give more details. So if I could give? More details, more details on the use yeah, so of um, magnetic moments. Yeah, so, so at the moment, um, so generically, these are called single molecule magnets. They're typical small molecular clusters with something like four to 12 atoms, which connect together to give an overall magnetic moment. Um, and traditionally, um, uh, you know, in terms of classical magnetism, these would be seen to have um, well-defined spin states, but it, but it turns out, you know, actually the state that you see is a, is a combination of, of various spin states. And the whole idea about a qubit is it can exist in various quantum forms in, uh, at once. Yes. Okay. Um, so I would say that the, the research in this area at the moment is still more to do with understanding the quantum mechanical properties of these individual molecules and the way in which you can uh, you can um, excite transitions between the different spin states. We are, an, I have to say, we're an awful long way from having anything that's a practical qubit, but certainly understanding what the way in which the information might be encoded in a single molecular magnet is something that people are looking at. How you address them and how you couple them together in arrays of qubits is, and so, so the next step is actually to couple, and there's a whole area of research, really clever chemistry. How do you couple together 
um, individual single molecule magnets to produce arrays of, uh, well, they're no longer single, but you know what I mean. And then looking at the way in which the quantum states mix uh, across the array. So it's, um, I, I'm, I'm by no means an expert, but let's just say we're at the stage of trying to understand how the individual SMMs work. And they're really, I mean, the uh, classic uh, group in, yeah, go on. I could just speak, yeah, yeah. So um, the second question is um, relating to the magnetic excitations you mentioned, if um, possibly um, they can find use in materials research or is there any application for them in materials research? For a study of magnetic excitations? This is where I, I could hand over yes. to Pascal yeah. and she could, it's probably gonna mean your lecture actually, but. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in practical terms, this is, uh, this is the basic way in which you measure the strength of the coupling between magnetic atoms. And if you, if for, you know, just let's say for the sake of argument, you wanted to understand how to make, um, in, in a rational way, uh, a more powerful um, uh, magnetic alloy, then your first step is actually to understand the mechanism of the coupling. I have to say that mostly the preparation of these magnets is is, is witchcraft. People cook up all sorts <laughs> of, I think it's true to, I'm, we understand aspects of the, um, the uh, it's, okay, that was a little bit harsh, um, but let's just say that when it comes to practical magnets, a lot of the time it's not just okay. the of the specific metal it's also to do with the metallurgy and the defects in the metal and the annealing process and so forth so i think when we come to try to understand the property of a, a pure you know single crystal or well-defined polycrystalline sample looking at the excitations is the most incisive probe of all the factors that determine the magnet you know it, so it's the strength of the coupling between the atoms but it can also be the crystallographic environment what we call the ligand field theory the crystal field um, but when it comes to practical magnets, um, there's still a huge element of trying to understand and then control the metallurgy, because in magnets is often also the defects, the granularity and the so forth that determines that. And I'm, I'm far from an expert on that. But understanding that is it's something that, for example, small angle scattering is, is used to some extent to try and correlate the properties of the magnet and the way it's been formed with the, uh, with, with the, the, the larger scale structure. So it's a bit harsh, Pascal, to say it's witchcraft. But I think when it comes no, to practical no, magnets... No, I, I think you're entirely correct, because in fact, um, we do spend a lot of time worrying about impurities and, and things like that. But I would actually go back a bit and say that, um, ex, uh, as you stated, if you do not understand the excitations of material, but you only understand where the atoms are, you will not understand the physical processes that, that are within the material. And that's that develop or, or how you derive, let's say the thermodynamic properties. So you really, the excitations are the key to understanding the material. Uh, and with that comes um, the computing requirements that, that are needed to, to understand these excitations, et cetera. So neutron scattering, X-ray inelastic, X-ray scattering, it is all vital to try and understand novel materials in this sense. Exactly. So it means that this is really the theoretical part as well of all of the analyze. What we are doing is really to prove from the experimental point of view, but this is the reality. And indeed, in terms of the theory, that's also really good because in, in I think, and I don't know if uh, I correct you, you had as well a theory background. So we have theorists uh, as well who could uh, potentially help as well and, and look at this aspect, which I think is the important part to try to couple the understanding of this multiphysic. You were speaking about the thermodynamics, we were speaking about the mechanical effect, what is as well from the sheer point of view, the effect that it will have now if you have a sample and this sample is never perfect. So then back to what you were mentioning as well, Andrew, with the difficulty to have the perfect sample. If we have it small enough, then we minimize as well the potential uh, difficulty mm -hmm. to have some homogeneity. So there are a lot of unknown and error if we look at the experimental part. But in theory, we can analyze quite a lot from the savoir and the, the know-how that we already have. It's just to combine it together and have a system complex enough that will then ask for a lot of uh, of, uh, of computing uh, capacity. And then this is one of the things as well with uh, what we are doing, uh, Pascal, with the, the DMSC that is uh, at least it should not be a limit uh, 
or it should be a way as well to, to I think, I think those issues. It's interesting. When I did my PhD uh, 20 odd years ago, you would be able to write a paper on a magnetic system that would go from one phase to another and you would follow a Bragg peak and you would state, okay, we have followed this Bragg peak representing this type of magnetic order. And we know that the transition was here and it follows this sort of scaling law. Um, these days that is not possible. You can no longer um, have a pure experimental paper. Theory, yeah. computation Absolutely. and experiment has to combine together. You cannot yeah. publish anything without it. So it's, it's, it's a very exciting time, I think, for younger people because you really have to work with the theorist in a way that we, that we never had to before. Not in my time, not in Andrew's time. Um, yeah. But these Definitely days, you know, I, when I write application for grants now, it's not just for an experimental work. You have to get the experimentalists and the crystal growers, the computation people and the experimentalists, the theorists. It, it has to be a package. You cannot do anything by yourself, yeah. which is exciting, but also quite difficult. <laughs> And it means that teamwork is critical as well. Yes. You've got to find the right team. And, mm -hmm. and that's also exciting. And, and that's also one of the beauties of working in an international place because you get people from completely different backgrounds who have a complete, you know, if you get a Hungarian who's got a great background in maths and then, I don't know, French person who's usually a great engineer and whatever, and those are stereotypes. But the point is people from quite different backgrounds um, uh, also bring these different analytic skills to a, to, to a an experiment yeah. as well. And I think it puts into question as well this, this very typical image of a scientist. The scientist is a lone figure, typically a man, working by themselves. Uh, this is how culturally is, it is yeah. it is shown. It's not at all true. We work in big groups and together and, and yeah. from the youngest scientist to the oldest professor, everyone has something to contribute and I think that's really wonderful. And I see somebody says, I hope to tackle some of these challenges in the future and, and I hope you come and yeah. join us because it's it's, it's a wonderful place to work it's your call yeah. i'm really going to have to go i've got to go to another meeting but look mm -hmm. um yeah, time, so sorry indeed and, and what i wanted to add on that is exactly what we are trying as well to aim at at ESS and in all those research infrastructure more or less as well this reason of being of this uh, series to couple and to build this ecosystem so to what you were describing we need to add the industry and then we need to add as well the case, the science case, which would drive as well the, the possibility as well for getting the funding as well from the government, let's say. So, so it means that all together, yes, this is a, not only a multi-physic, but a multi-skilled effort. So I think it's really good to have all the, the as well with Samela, I think it was really interesting. Samela, thank you so much for your participation and for yeah, the, absolutely. the Brazilian side as well, some insight into how and how they're doing there. So I think that we could definitely think in terms of yeah generally how we will hook this up. So this is why you have uh, you have to go. But uh, so thank you. I have to go. I'm afraid. So I think everything I'm, uh, really. I'm a couple uh, of minutes into the mic, but look, it's been a real pleasure uh, engaging with so you've been great students. Um, sorry, I couldn't actually see more of you, um, Pascal. I will look out for your talk as well. Um, yes. And Christine, thanks for being setting this up. It's been fantastic. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, this is and, the last slide. So as well, and I will update all the slides. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. I'm really got to go now. I'm sorry, so sorry, but it's been a real. Thank it's you been so much for your time and hey. sorry for the inconvenience. We'll no, no, not at all. Not at all. Bye, bye for now. Okay. I don't know. Um, oh, how, do I, how do I stop this? So you just go to the bottom right, and so you can go out. Oh. oh. I can't stop it, Christine. Oh, oh stop share. Okay, I can, voila. Oh yeah, okay. No, it's because I hadn't got the same view as you guys. Yeah. It's, it's suddenly gone dark here as well. Um, oh, oh, I'll just close if this. You, I mean, don't worry, just quit your computer or do you want that? Otherwise, I just, voila, he managed to put. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, so I had as well for your comment. I think it was, uh, it was very constructive and uh, it's, Perfect as well for Pascal to have been involved, so she's not there anymore. And Malik, I hope that uh, you had your question as well answered, uh, even if indeed you you couldn't you couldn't speak up. So we really encourage as well for uh, the coming uh, courses in uh, in uh, January. So to have now this background and then looking at uh, all the different uh, material that I showed you at the beginning, so you can have a great vacation and learn even more. <laughs> 
So in any case, we're really delighted to, um, to, to think in terms of who will be and how you can build up as well for the future of uh, potentially this African light source, but as well, we know for the neutron, it could be also quite an interesting aspect by coming and participating as well to some of the, the beam time or as well building uh, some of the those neutron uh, source that we are building in Europe or in America or in uh, Japan. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. And uh, so we hope to see you on the 12th of uh, January for the next uh, presentation. So the part B of uh, all this series. And if you have questions in the meantime, so I'll be more than happy to answer to them. And I will update because I know that there was few things that were maybe on the website as well, not properly linked. So I will check this up and I will cross check that the slide that he presented today are as well uh, the, the same than what uh, we put already last week on the website. So thank you very much and uh, hope to see you then in uh, January. And in the meantime, uh, enjoy the, your vacation. So that's uh, important to rest as well with your family and uh, your loved one. So good luck uh, for uh, this end of the year and stay safe, as we would say. Bye. I lost the link. Uh, I, I will send you the link, uh, Correct. So I have your email, so that would be good. So thank you. Bye.